Hey there everybody! Welcome or welcome back to the channel for the Incredibles Iceberg Chart Explanation, brought to you by u slash Neon Konomi. I'm glad to share this video with y'all today, and I'm really excited to be visiting yet another Pixar film. Before I begin, let me say that there will be spoilers for The Incredibles, Incredibles 2, and also some of the related comics and media. Please make sure to like the video and comment your favorite entry or any other trivia you know about The Incredibles. I really love it when you guys interact with these videos, so let's make sure that if you like this one, you subscribe for more similar content. With that all over with, let's dive deep into The Incredibles Iceberg Explanation. A113 a113 is an inside joke slash easter egg present in tons of Pixar films. The digits come from a classroom at the California Institute of the Arts, where John Lasseter, Tim Burton, Michael Pereza, and Brad Bird all went. It has tons of other Pixar appearances, and in The Incredibles it's a very subtle one. Mr. Incredible is held at a prison cell at level A1 section 13, or A113. Brad Bird Brad Bird is an extremely accomplished director with all kinds of animation projects under his belt, including The Incredibles. He animated his first short film at 14, sending it off to Disney and getting an internship with Disney's Nine Old Men, the nine animators who created some of Disney's first cartoons from the 30s until the 70s. He was an old friend of John Lasseter, and through that connection, he joined Pixar, where he pitched some film ideas, including The Incredibles. He wrote and directed the movie, and if there's one man you could say was responsible for the entire franchise, it would be him. The Pixar Theory The Pixar Theory is the ever-popular idea that all of the Pixar films take place in one universe. I won't explain the entire thing here because it's a giant beast of a theory, but you can watch this popular video to get an understanding of the whole thing. Here's how The Incredibles fits into it, though. It's the second movie in the theory after Brave, and there are two big developments in the Pixar universe that come out of it. The first is the creation of AI, and the second is the creation of Zero Point Energy, which actually goes on to power the toys in Toy Story. Jack-Jack Attack Jack-Jack Attack is a short film about Jack-Jack, made a year after The Incredibles came out. It follows Rick Dicker, a government agent interviewing Jack-Jack's babysitter, and ultimately erasing her memory. It fills in some details about what happened in the film after the family left Jack-Jack, and it's pretty funny. Traumatized Mr. Incredible meme. This meme is probably one you've all seen. It began when someone on Twitter had the bright idea to make this realistic picture of Mr. Incredible, which is horrifying enough, but then people modified it more and more, taking the color out and then giving it a filter that makes it look like the copied science handout that you got from your teacher in 8th grade. Some people went off to make nice, wholesome versions of this meme, and good for them, but others, however, decided to make it more and more dark, which eventually culminated into this terrible hierarchy, which is where the modern meme was born. The meme in this stage is referred to as Uncanny Mr. Incredible. I think this goes beyond just uncanny, but that's just my opinion. Pixar's first human-centric film before this film, Pixar had made Toy Story 1 and 2, A Bug's Life, Finding Nemo, and Monsters, Inc., none of which had a primarily human cast or plot. That all changed with The Incredibles, which was their first ever human-centric film. PG Rating So, of all the Pixar movies, 12 of the currently 25 are rated PG, but The Incredibles was the first to get the PG rating instead of a G rating. Can you take a wild guess why? Cape snagged on a missile gun. Cape caught in a jet turbine. Mm. <laughs> Incredicoaster. The Incredicoaster is an incredible themed roller coaster at Disneyland. More specifically, it's at the Disneyland California Adventure Park. The park was originally created in 1998 to celebrate the history of California, and the roller coaster that would eventually be rebranded as the Incredicoaster was built originally called the California Screamin'. Now, reusing and rebranding pieces of attractions, or literally entire rides, isn't all that uncommon in the theme park world. In fact, if you watch my Monsters Inc. Iceberg video, which you should if you haven't, I talk about an animatronic being reused in a Monsters Inc. attraction, which, though a small detail, is pretty interesting. But back to the Incredicoaster. It has a top speed of 55 miles an hour, and it's currently the tallest coaster at a Disney park. No capes. Edna Mode was not a fan of capes for superhero costumes, and for good reason. 
but her saying it has kind of turned into a meme, which isn't surprising given how funny it is. No kicks! Well, go on, your no suit will be finished before your next assignment. Michael Giacchino. Michael Giacchino is a composer who made the score to The Incredibles. It was released three days before the movie came out, and it's received a ton of awards. Bird was very specific with what he wanted, noting that the soundtrack needed a 60s feel, which is why Giacchino put so many brass instruments in the movie, because those were popular at the time. Overall, I'd say he did a pretty good job. Fantastic Four Comparison it's pretty clear that the Incredibles family are similar in design and power to the Fantastic Four, both having a super strong dude, stretchy person, and an invisible woman. It's possible there was some inspiration taken from the Fantastic Four, but a lot of people get heated about it thinking that the Incredibles are a ripoff of the Marvel group, and Bird himself has stated that the characters are really just based off superhero tropes and not any one group specifically. Auntie Edna Auntie Edna is a 2018 short film. It's also pretty funny and shows a much happier, kinder version of Edna. Pixar Popcorn Pixar Popcorn is a series of shorts from 2021 about different Pixar movies, including two based on The Incredibles. These are titled Chore Day The Incredibles Way and Cookie Num Num. Incredibles 2 was completed ahead of schedule. According to an interview with Bob Odenkirk, the voice actor for Winston Dever, because Bird was so confident in his story, Incredibles 2 didn't go through the ringer like many other Pixar films do. In fact, the movie was slated for a 2019 release, but it actually got pushed to 2018 because the group was so ahead of schedule. Tricycle Kid Meme This scene from The Incredibles has been turned into a meme. So what are you waiting for? Me too, kid. Which usually depicts something that the creator of the meme has been waiting on for a long time, giving it a typically sad tone. The meme can be used to show something as little as a game that a person wants, or something huge like happiness, which is really depressing to be honest. Nineteen sixty two. You might be wondering when The Incredibles takes place. Though it's obviously inspired by life in the 60s, there's a lot that doesn't quite reflect the 1960s perfectly. Despite that, we know that from this shot, the original movie takes place in 1962. That also means that the beginning part of this film takes place in 1947. National Supers Agency Audio Files The National Supers Agency that I'll now be referring to as the NSA Audio Files were a bonus feature on the Incredibles DVD release which have 24 pure minutes of lore about the supers and the world of the Incredibles. This is where most of our understanding of other supers comes from. Mr. Incredible and Pals Mr. Incredible and Pals is a 2005 short film, a bonus feature on the Incredibles DVD. It has a much different art style from the movie, but it's actually quite interesting. It's designed to imitate low-budget cartoons from the 1950s and 60s with details such as limited animation to save money, an animal sidekick with no real purpose besides having an appeal to children, Americanized heroes, and a communist-like villain. And interestingly, Frozone speaking with beatnik slang, Dig it, Daddy-O. Which was something minority characters often used in old cartoons, showing how out of touch the creators usually were with their communities. If you're a fan of old media, I'd really encourage you to check this one out. Super Registration Act Plot Resemblances The idea of a superhero registration act is a trope in superhero media. All kinds of superhero movies follow some sort of situation where the American government forces them to make a database of themselves. Though this started with Marvel's X-Men's Mutant Registration Act, it's persisted throughout superhero media to this day, and it's often used to subtly convey political topics, such as logging communists, members of the LGBT community, and even American gun politics. This is also something that occurs in the Incredibles movie and is an integral part of the plot. Though it doesn't really mean anything politically, people have used it to justify some crazy conclusions about the movie, which we'll talk about later. Video Game Tie-Ins There were a couple of tie-in video games for this movie. The Incredibles the Rise of the Underminer was one of them, which sought to explain what happened with the Underminer, though this story would eventually be retconned by Incredibles 2. There was also a game just called Incredibles. They're both considered to be okay at best and terrible at worst. Later on they would make a Lego game. Missing Pizza Planet Truck 
Despite appearances in just about every single Pixar movie, the Pizza Planet truck does not appear in The Incredibles. It does, however, show up in The Incredibles video game. This is what Brad Bird had to say about its lack of appearance. I don't know. I was busy making the movie. I didn't think about the Pizza Planet. Disney Infinity Not only was there an Incredibles playset for Disney Infinity, but there was also a full storyline. Interestingly, the story is a non-canon version of the real story where Syndrome is still alive. Apparently, the game was going to use the Underminer as a villain, but they realized Syndrome would be more popular and recognizable, so they just made the game non-canon. Violet is an older Boo Some suggest that Violet is actually an older version of Boo from Monsters, Inc. It makes a little sense, since they're similar, and it's pretty obvious that the Pixar movies are connected, but I personally don't believe it. Mostly because Boo's real name is Mary, not Violet. To which you could say that Violet is a nickname or codename, but we don't really know for sure. Also, their personalities are extremely different. Where Violet is very shy and contained, Boo is very outgoing and laughable. But, what about this scene from Monsters, Inc., where Sully can't find Boo? Could it be that Boo is actually turning invisible? That's really the best piece of evidence for this theory, though I still don't personally believe in it. Johnny Quest Johnny Quest is a classic Hanna-Barbera cartoon from the 60s which appears in the background of this shot in The Incredibles 2. It's probably there because it's very representative of 60s media. Bon Voyage in Ratatouille Bon Voyage actually makes a cameo as a street mime in Ratatouille. Now you might be thinking, maybe he got better and was released from prison. Wrong. He's actually still active back in France, and we can see that from this newspaper clip in the same movie. It's well known that France won't extradite their own citizens, so Bon Voyage likely escaped prison in America and made it back home, never to return to America or ever see an American jail cell. Supers were created by the government. A fan theory, which I tend to believe, suggests that supers were created by the government, which would explain why the government is so concerned with keeping supers hidden and under wraps. It would also explain why supers have been trained in martial arts and other techniques. Something we'll get into a bit later is the idea of World War II in the Incredibles universe, and it's thought that supers were originally supposed to be soldiers in World War II. This theory kind of goes to the toilet when we learn that supers can develop spontaneously in the second movie, but that might be due to the gene pool spreading. Who knows? Lego theme. The Incredibles got some Lego sets as part of their Junior series, and there's also a Lego Incredibles game. While the minifigures are cool, the sets aren't all impressive in my opinion, which is pretty disappointing. As a big LEGO fan, a huge Underminer set or Omnidroid Battle, for example, all could have been cool. There's still hope for the future, though. Out of Breath Method Acting Brad Bird made Spencer Fox, who voiced Dash, run laps around the studio to get him out of breath before his recordings. That's actually incredibly funny to me. I know nothing about acting, but I'm sure as an actor he could have just started breathing quickly to raise his heart rate and then pretend to be tired, but no, this dude actually had to run laps like a kid in gym class who lost a game of dodgeball. New Math This entry refers to this scene where Bob is going through a struggle many parents face, decoding their kids' math homework. With new and new ways to teach the same basic math facts being used in different places at different times, I can imagine why Bob got as heated as he did. But this isn't just a small change. This detail from the movie reflects a real American reform called New Math that actually happened in real life. It was inspired after the Soviet Union launched Sputnik and the American government felt that they needed to make their kids smarter. You know, I'm starting to see a lot of Cold War history influencing the plot of this movie. But anyway, New Math tried to get students to figure out the answer to a math problem before being given the formula, which encourages less repetition and memorization and more creative thinking and innovation. Comic Book in Finding Nemo In the dentist's waiting room in Finding Nemo, you can see a boy reading a Mr. Incredible comic. This is a very important detail connecting the two movies, which also suggests that the outlook of supers may become more positive in the future, given that kids are still reading stuff about Mr. Incredible whenever Finding Nemo takes place, which, though I don't know the exact date off the back of my head, is certainly not the 1960s. Googie Architecture Googie architecture is a style of futuristic architecture which was popular in the 40s to the 70s, both in real life and in media. This inspired many of the buildings and scenes of The Incredibles, which, as we know, was going for a 60s feel. Googie architecture is very much dead now, which is kind of sad because some of it's really cool, but you could see the similarities between these buildings in real life and in the movie. It's not just the buildings though, it's the whole aesthetic. 
It's really visible in Dever's house in the second film, for example. Incredibles 2 theme songs. In The Incredibles 2 OST, Frozone, Elastigirl, and Mr. Incredible all get their own theme songs. I won't play them here for obvious reasons, but you can give them a listen if you want. 2018 Winter Olympics TV Spots There were a couple of commercials for Incredibles 2 during the 2018 Winter Olympics, which you could still see online. High Karate You could see Frozone using an aftershave called High Karate, which was an actual brand of aftershave sold in the 60s. One person called it the Axe Body Spray of the 60s. Its advertising campaign showed men putting it on and then having to use karate to fight women off. Just take a look at this commercial. I'm after shave. High Karate Oriental Lime, with indispensable instructions on self-defense in every package. High Karate Oriental Lime. Be careful how you use it. Disney Heroes Battle Mode The Incredibles family are all playable characters in Disney Heroes Battle Mode, a mobile game. This is what it looks like. Originally conceived as a 2D film When Bird pitched his story to Lasseter, he actually thought it up as a 2D film, though Lasseter convinced him to come to Pixar where it could be made with computer animation. And the rest is history. Doc Hudson's Early Bird Appearance Though it's not the real Doc Hudson, an actual Hudson Hornet can be seen in the Incredibles movie, despite the fact that Cars wasn't out yet. Though it was far enough into production that they probably knew about Doc Hudson. It's a neat little detail. Edna Mode is a reformed villain Was Edna Mode once a supervillain? Some tend to think so, given her villainous looking lair and appearance. Also, the amount she seems to know about supers makes people think she might be spying on them, or she just knows a little bit too much. I don't know, what do you guys think? Gamma Jack is a super supremacist. According to the audio files with information about supers, Gamma Jack views supers as a superior race. He's also one of the only supers willing to kill villains. He says a lot of questionable things in his interview, and these are some of my favorites. Part of my job is to prioritize uh, uh, which villains I'm going to combat, you know, so, uh, you know, I take a look around, I see if there's any, uh, good-looking, uh, women who need to be rescued immediately, and then I sort of start from there and work my way down the list, you know, if you've got, uh, uh, tubby Joe Schmo over there with, uh, a laser pointed at his head, and he might have to wait in line a little while. Yeah, I've thought my, uh, my... Honey Best Honey is the wife of Frozone, who's only ever voiced, never visibly shown in the movie. Snug was meant to pilot the plane to No Man is an Island. Snug is a character that was cut from the movie. He was going to be an old friend of Helen Parr, and he would be the one to fly the plane to Syndrome's Island, but he would be killed by the missile strike. He was cut out because there wasn't enough time for him to be on screen to make his death memorable enough. Nobody would get attached to him, and then he would just die, so it ended up that Helen was the one that flew the plane. It was never animated, but there is a storyboard of it. The Outer Limits the Outer Limits is another TV show that makes an appearance in The Incredibles 2. But what could it mean? To briefly explain The Outer Limits, it was sort of a ripoff of The Twilight Zone, and the intro has a lot to do with the narrator being in control of the program. Just watch a clip of it here. There is nothing wrong with your television set. Do not attempt to adjust the picture. We are controlling transmission. We this actually hints at the villain Screenslaver who would appear in the film a bit later on. Superhero. The digits of Mirage's phone number interestingly spell out superhero. Well, without the E's at least. Syndrome is a super. There's a lot of talk surrounding whether or not Syndrome is actually a super. Sure, he exists to oppose the supers, but he's nothing to scoff at. Though he has no apparent physical abilities, he is extremely intelligent. He literally invented rocket boots when he was 10 years old. I guess the question is more whether or not you think intelligence is a superpower, or if superpowers only include physical strength. It's up for you to decide, I guess. One way or another, Syndrome has some serious talent. We'll be revisiting this topic in the last entry of this iceberg, so stay tuned. A Real Stretch, an Elastigirl prequel story. A Real Stretch is a prequel story highlighting Elastigirl's career during the golden age of supers. In this book, she meets Bob, and it's also revealed that her maiden name is Highwater. 
alternate opening in Incredibles 1. In the first Incredibles movie, there's an entirely different opening sequence. It never got animated, but the storyboard is on YouTube. It focused more on the characters as parents and a family, not just supers, and is quite interesting because of a lot of plot differences. Check it out. My grandmother gave that to me. Ah! <laughs> that grandma, what big teeth she has! Syndrome. <laughs> Don't act surprised, Incredible. I mean, Mr. Smith. You didn't really think that getting a new life would absolve you of the last one, did you? You had to know I'd be back to settle accounts. Best part. Super's memorial scene. There's a deleted storyboard from Incredibles 2 with a memorial for Gazer Beam. It's one of the best deleted scenes out there, and many think it should have been in the film. You didn't really understand jokes or how to set people at ease. And of course, there were the eyes. Crazy, light blue eyes that could see in astounding detail, see through many surfaces, and if you focus them right, could burn through solid metal. Add these unsettling eyes to a less than ingratiating personality, and you have an outcast. Although he tried to hide his powers, a few of us had heard about them and approached him. Had to talk him into becoming a superhero. Look, laser eyes, the only way you'll ever fit in is to do what we do. Make what's odd about you an asset. Announce your weirdness with a cool name and an outfit and wear them proudly. I myself came up with the name Gazer Bean. He didn't like it. Wanted something more sober. Viewpoint, he liked. He'd say, how about viewpoint? Terrible, we told him. Sounds like a TV show nobody watches. Liked... Die Hard 3 homage. There's a subtle reference to Die Hard 3 in the scene where Frozone gets a drink, which looks a lot like this scene from Die Hard 3 where Samuel L. Jackson answers a telephone. Check this out. I have to answer that phone. Get him up! Look, if you have to shoot me, then you go ahead and you shoot me. But I have to answer this phone, all right? Vowlet. Vowlet, an essay by Sarah Vowell, is a short documentary about Sarah Vowell, the voice actress for Violet, and her experiences outside of the movie. Strangely, it only comes on the Region 1 DVD set, not any other region. You can find it online, though it's not nearly as popular as other bonus features or shorts. Brad Bird was offered to join Pixar in 1995. So Brad Bird joined Pixar in 2000, but he actually had the chance to do so in 1995. He turned down his first invitation, but after he felt that Warner Bros botched the launch of his movie The Iron Giant, he changed his mind and ended up going to Pixar. Syndrome was originally meant to be a minor villain. In an early draft of the film, Syndrome was just going to be a one-off villain, and the main villain would be Zarek, who we'll talk about later. In an alternate opening for the movie, he was Mr. Incredible's age-old nemesis who would visit their home and attack the family, disguising himself as a burglar and then he would die when the gas made in the house exploded. Thunderhead is gay. While there's no explicit confirmation that Thunderhead is gay, he lives with his roommate Scott and they have five adopted children together, so it's heavily implied that they're in a relationship. Rosone was a former Olympic athlete. Shawnee Davis, Olympic speed skater, is thought to be an inspiration for Frozo. In the Incredibles universe, according to NSA Files, Frozone was also a speed skater, but he couldn't compete in the Olympics due to his abilities giving him an unfair advantage. I guess that makes sense. Mr. Incredible in Smash Flash Super Smash Flash is a Smash-style game where you can actually play as Mr. Incredible, amongst many other random characters. He wasn't well liked in the game and wasn't brought back for the sequel, though the game's developers did hint at bringing him back for the sequel as an April Fool's joke. Buddy is the son of Phylonge and Apaji. Earlier we talked about Syndrome being a super, but what if he was the child of two supers? That would explain why he idolizes supers so much and he has access to crazy and dangerous tech parts as a child. Specifically, he may be the child of Phylonge and Apaji, for no reason other than a slight resemblance to both of them. If this theory were true, it would also make sense if Syndrome himself didn't have any powers, so he grew up his whole life wanting to be Super and thinking he would, but when he didn't, he got angry at superheroes. Also, take a look at this clip from the alternate opening scene where Syndrome breaks into the Incredibles family home. You are breaking the law, Mr. Incredible. 
You know supers aren't supposed to breed. <coughs> The way he says breed just makes it seem like he's an unwanted or neglected or otherwise angry product of two superheroes. It's kind of a crazy theory, but it does sort of make a little sense. She Lactrix. I think this is actually supposed to be She Lectrix, which was the original name for He Lectrix back when the character was supposed to be female. Violet is adopted. It's theorized by some that Violet is actually adopted and may really be the child of Edna Moe. The theory has to do with the fact that they look similar, but essentially, it's speculated that Edna got pregnant and retired from costume making to raise her child. But once she realized the child had powers, she turned to Mr. Incredible and Elastigirl to raise her, since she felt like she herself would be incapable. Since the alternate opening to the movie shows a baby Violet, I'd say this one isn't true, but regardless, it's an interesting thought. Brain Freezer Brain Freezer is a minor villain who appears in LEGO The Incredibles alongside her twin sister Sally Sunday. She fell into a pit of experimental ice cream, causing her to turn into a supervillain. Alright then. Blaystone is a dimension hopper. In Blaystone's interview from the first movie, she jokes about not knowing which dimension she's in. It seems as if it's just a joke, but at the same time, she takes it pretty seriously. Have a listen. Oh, okay. <laughs> I am so sorry, I, I know what the problem is. I, can't, I keep on forgetting which dimension I'm in. Wait, which, which, which dimension am I in? We also know that Jack-Jack can jump dimensions, so that is possible for superheroes to do. What do y'all make of this? Anchorman. Don Wheeler, otherwise known as Anchorman, is another LEGO Incredible supervillain who was a news anchor who got lost at sea and then became evil. Uh... <laughs> He also invaded the city with evil fishermen. Okay, I gotta stop right here. I know this is a kid's game, but these characters are actually atrocious. These guys are like the polka dot man of the Incredibles universe. That is just, <laughs> he got lost at sea and became evil. Wow. Mesmerella. Mesmerella is a character from the Incredibles comic book series, being a master of hypnosis. In the comic she appears in, she fights the Incredibles family by taking over Violet's mind and causing her to activate a Doomsday device, which she of course fails to do. She was based off Mesmero, and in all honesty, had zero time to be fleshed out as a character. Lily Tomlin Lily Tomlin was originally considered for the role of Edna Mode, but she turned it down. With more and more failed attempts to cast Mode, Brad Bird just did it himself. Look at this. Because he's the only one who can. If you repress, you depress, darling. To impress, you must express. I had literally no idea this was him until I saw this clip. John Barry. Keeping up with the theme of people who could have worked on the movie but didn't, John Barry was a composer who was the first choice to make the musical score for The Incredibles. Originally, the studio wanted to use some of his music from On Her Majesty's Secret Service, a James Bond film, which would help keep up with the theme of spies in the 60s. Also, if you haven't already, please check out my Bond series Iceberg, which I think you might like. Anyways, Barry didn't want to use anything from his previous works, so the position of composer went to Michael Giacchino instead. Hungover Hero Hungover Hero is a skin for the character Demo Man in Team Fortress 2. If you can't already see it, let me point out its resemblance to Frozone's look. Gallery Nucleus Gallery Nucleus is an art store slash community that has tons of Incredibles artwork for sale. I'm not sure what pieces, if any, this entry is referring to specifically, but there's a ton of sold and unsold pieces on the Incredibles out there. Invincibles Invincibles was an early working title for the film. Brad Bird changed it to The Incredibles later on because he thought it was a more marketable name for a family. Also, another name the movie originally had while in production was Tights. Incredibles 1 Forced Changes on Fantastic Four Script This entry is quite fascinating. So we talked about how the Fantastic Four resemble the Incredibles family a lot, but the 2005 Fantastic Four movie actually had to be changed to deal with plot similarities in The Incredibles. While we're not entirely sure what was changed, we do know that it caused a lot of special effects to be added. Jack-Jack has 17 superpowers. Jack-Jack has, at least, 17 superpowers. These include cloning himself, 
going goblin mode, laser eyes, creating fire, stretching himself, traveling through dimensions, metamorphosis, super strength and vulnerability, floating, telekinesis, flying, electrical emission, walking through walls, turning into metal, making blobs, and being able to perfectly mimic people. This dude is going to be so OP one day. I honestly bet that they'll make a comic or something about him being a bad guy in like 25 years, purely to pit superheroes against him because of how powerful he is. Harrison Ford. It's kind of a meme online that Harrison Ford should play Rick Dicker if there's ever a live action Incredibles, which I doubt will ever happen, but he'd be a great choice because it was rumored that he was actually considered as a voice actor for Mr. Incredible. Little Big Planet Level Kit. Little Big Planet had these things called level kits that you could buy. They're basically little DLCs, and they made one that was Incredibles themed, which you can check out here. Stratagale's Age. Stratagal was a high schooler when she discovered her powers, and by the time she was killed, she was just 19 years old. Yikes. That helps explain why Edna was so against capes. Syndrome works for the US government. What if Syndrome worked for the US government and he was hired to hunt down superheroes one by one? This honestly makes a whole lot of sense. If you ignore a lot about what we know about Syndrome's childhood and just think of him now, how would he have all this money a private island and be able to create a ton of destruction without the US government getting involved. I mean, he literally has a private army, which might be something the US government would look into. Unless, of course, it's a government conspiracy to eliminate the last of the supers. I find this sort of unlikely because the way Syndrome went about doing his thing naturally generated positive superhero sentiment, but what do you guys think? Atlas Shrugged. Atlas Shrugged is a book written by Ayn Rand, which is part of her works about her philosophy, Objectivism, which would require way too much time to talk about, but basically think libertarianism, but a lot. It's also very anti-government. People have compared Brad Bird to Ayn Rand because parts of the Incredibles movie criticize government involvement in good things. Many people think The Incredibles has to do with showing that the government is wrong and shouldn't regulate everything. However, the plot of The Incredibles is pretty unique to the rest of Brad Bird's movies. He didn't never write about the same stuff outside of The Incredibles, so I don't think The Incredibles reflects his personal philosophy in any way. It's just that you can make some very broad comparisons behind the idea of The Incredibles and Ayn Rand's work. Thrilling 3 Disbandment The Thrilling 3 were a group originally made of Phylonge, Apogee, and Dynagai the leader. After Dynagai's death, Gazerbeam joined and became the new leader, but soon after, the three broke up. There were differences in thought between Phylonge and Gazerbeam, which partially led to them breaking up, but Phylonge made it clear that he harbors no ill will towards Gazerbeam. Zarek Zarek was the original antagonist in early drafts of The Incredibles, but he was swapped for Syndrome and was relegated to a role in the comic books. He was almost 200 years old and at one point Elastigirl's boyfriend before she caught on to him, and his main goal was immortality which sort of drove his actions in the movie, but honestly, I'm really glad they swapped him out with Syndrome. Syndrome's story is so much better. Agent Mirage In the comic books, it's shown that after the events of the Incredibles movie, Mirage joins the NSA as an agent. She actually has to work alongside Elastigirl to fight Zarek, and there's a ton of conflict between the two of them. First in Line promo. The First in Line trailer was a previously lost media clip. It's one of three online videos made to promote The Incredibles back in 2004, the other two being Still First in Line and First in Line Sold Out. The first clip was eventually found in a promotional CD-ROM and later on, the others were dumped to archive.org. Hayao Miyazaki was shown early film reels. Brad Bird invited Hayao Miyazaki, a very important voice in the animation world, to watch some of the movie during production. Bird asked him whether or not he thought the movies were good or just American nonsense, and Miyazaki said, I think it's a very adventurous thing what you're trying to do in American film. So apparently, he liked it. DC Comics made a compromise with Pixar to keep the Elastigirl name. This is a pretty interesting entry. If you're a DC fan, you may know of their hero, Elastigirl. A DC objected to the use of the Elastigirl name because of their own character, and Pixar suggested a compromise. They would refer to Helen Parr as Mrs. Incredible in all the advertising outside of the movies, but within the movie, she could be called Elastigirl. The Incredibles and Kingdom Hearts X Like many other Pixar IPs, the Incredibles family makes an appearance in Kingdom Hearts. You can check out what it looks like here. Incredibles 2 Rogue AI Plot like the first movie, the main antagonist of Incredibles 2 was originally going to be much different than what we got. 
In early drafts of the film, the enemy would be a rogue AI taking over technology and at one point would have destroyed Edna's mansion. However, it was dropped for being too similar to the Omnidroid plot. No Manison Island was turned into a resort. Syndrome's HQ was actually turned into a resort. We know this from Pixar's trailer for the resort, though it's mostly a joke, my favorite part being that they suggest the Omnidroids would give you massages. Y yeah, I think in canon this isn't actually real. Violet and Princess Academy concept art. Princess Academy was supposed to be a 2D short where lots of female Disney characters would get to interact with one another. It was in development for years, but without warning, Disney fired lots of 2D animators and pulled the plug on the project, wasting years of talented people's work. Though there aren't many materials about the short out there, you can see concept art of it, which Violet appears in. Mr. Incredible's Jar of Bullets You could see a jar of bullets on Mr. Incredible's desk, which were likely taken from all the bullets that failed to pierce him during his Golden Age crime fighting era. It actually says, bullets that failed to pierce my chest. But hang on, why would criminals shoot at him if they know he's bulletproof? You know, like I can imagine people doing it for a little while, but then they'd figure out that he's bulletproof and they'd stop. That's a whole lot of bullets. What if the bullets in this jar were from World War II? Seriously, this jar has been used to support a community-driven theory that Mr. Incredible fought in World War II, and further drives the theory that supers were even created by the US government to fight in World War II. But World War II was won earlier and easier than expected, so the government had to figure out what to do with these overpowered soldiers, which leads to the superhero registration stuff later. It's just a small theory, we really can't confirm it, but it is pretty interesting. Jack-Jack's full name. Jack-Jack's full name is John Jackson Parr. Like The Incredibles movie, I've kept this channel relatively PG, so I'm going to skip talking about both of these entries. And besides, I'd rather end this video on this next theory. Syndrome has schizophrenia. Okay, I'm really excited to talk about this entry, but I have to make a distinction real quick. Lots of people think that Syndrome may have a disorder, but I've never heard of it being schizophrenia. It's usually debated whether or not Syndrome has Down Syndrome or Autism. There isn't any evidence that he has schizophrenia, but there is evidence for the other two. Many people think that Syndrome may actually have Down Syndrome, given that he bears some facial similarities to others with Down Syndrome. Furthermore, if he's the child of a super, he may actually have powers, probably related to his intelligence like telekinesis or something, but due to his disability, it was counteracted and he was only able to have super intelligence. There's a better video explaining this which I'll link you to here and I encourage you to check them out if you're curious about the topic. Okay everyone, that's all for right now. Thanks for sticking around with me for this iceberg video. This was a ton of fun for me to make and talk about and I'm honored you decided to watch the Seed Butter channel today. Remember that you can always comment, DM, or email me about what you want to see next. And as always, make sure to subscribe to stick around for more content. Thanks again and have a great night.